is really renegotiating the post-World War I sites picot agreement and the boundaries that it put in place. Largely because a lot of these boundaries are artificial. These are countries that were drawn based on uh, some whim, for instance, Jordan was created largely to uh, compensate Prince Abdullah who helped the British during the uh, Arab uprising. And famously, uh, Churchill said, you know, here's 600,000 pounds in six months, let's see whether it works. Uh, and it's still there, but, but uh, the boundary lines were, did not have necessarily consent to the publics. They, uh, uh, the authoritarian regimes encapsulate a, an imbalance in relationship between religion, sect, and ethnicities. And the minute you have democracy or any kind of a challenge to these state boundaries, you're bound to have a recalibration. Now, the country that actually matters most in this is Syria. If Syria collapses in a large way, which looks like it's going to happen, uh, I, it is very difficult to see how the boundaries of Iraq, Lebanon, and Jordan will not be redrawn. Uh, largely, if, if uh, Syria either becomes a Sunni country or if it becomes fragmented, there's a good possibility that the Sunni part of Iraq will also uh, move away. And uh, similarly, Lebanon, uh, given its uh, fragmented system that it has already in place, that it will break up. Another factor that the Arab Spring is bringing about is that it has significantly eroded the capacity of states to protect their borders and to keep the systems. So gone is the powerful militaries, in some ways the bureaucracies that could keep things uh, in place. So in, in large measure, what we're really seeing is a massive implosion of the Arab world. I mean, the idea was that the Arab Spring was Arab revival, but in reality, it's actually, it's, it's eroded its power, it's collapsing, and, and it could, uh, at, at least fragmentation is one outcome. But I think what we're really seeing is that the, that the power is basically eroding completely out of the Arab world. Well, how are the Americans going to react? Are they just going to stand by and watch this happen? The West, how is Israel going to react? But I think Israel's reaction from the very beginning was a great deal of worry, because I think strategically Israel's uh, position in the Middle East was premised on the existence of a solid Arab state, an Arab system, that basically kept certain uh, boundary lines, certain assumptions, certain facts on the ground intact. Now the Arab world is, as I said, is collapsing. So Israel's main pillars, which were Egypt, Jordan, uh, to some extent Syria, are all gone. And to the extent that the, the, the Gulf countries were supporting some kind of a uh, Palestinian-Israeli engagement, right now they have other priorities and are too weak politically to support any kind of a serious concession. Uh, for a very long period, at least since 1978, Israel no longer had serious problem on its border with the exception of Hezbollah. So Egypt was taken out of the war with the peace treaty, Jordan was taken out, and Syria was largely dwarfed. Now again, Israel has hot borders, so the strategic situation is greatly shifted. So there is a lot of worry on Israel's part, and I think Israel would like ultimately the military to come back in Egypt. In other words, the restoration of the old regime, that the Jordanian regime would be beefed up. And I think deep down they hope that Assad will win, and you basically go to a status quo ante that you have. The United States is in a very different spot. I think the current administration, as outlined in my book, really doesn't think uh, that the Arab world matters anymore. And uh, it wasn't very interested when the Arab world was more democratic. And I think it's still operating on the assumption that even the worst things that can happen in the Arab world will not really matter enough for the United States uh, to, to intervene. So there is a certain you know, crisis management when things get really bad, but there is no great desire to intervene to provide a particular direction to things that, uh, the way that things are going. There's talk of, of, of Libya becoming the new Fatah. Uh, Libya is a, it looks like to become a failed state. Uh, it has a, a lot of weaponry, a lot of extremist groups there, very close proximity to Europe and to the rest of all that. Well, there are a lot of candidates for Fatah in the region. Uh, I mean, there is the Gaza Strip, there is big parts of Syria that are now ruled by Taliban-like uh, Al-Qaeda Emirates, there are parts of Iraq that are under control of, uh, of, of uh, extremist groups. What Fatah has, which is particularly uh, uh, unique about it, is actually its geography. 
In other words, the terrain in, in, in uh, Fatah makes it very difficult to bring uh, the tribes and the extremist groups on, uh, to heal. And also that it has had a tradition of not being governed, whereas most of these territories have been used to receiving uh, services and, uh, and, and being under state tutelage. But if the current trend in the East continues, you're going to end up with a lot of failed states or failing states with terrorist uh, territories that are outside of the control of central governments and that will begin to be a place where you're going to have crime, you're going to have drugs, you're going to have uh, also extremist groups to hold. Um, the second theme I want to discuss is, is the Shia divide. Uh, the Shia Sunni divide has become a huge game changer in countries like Iraq and Syria. We have an open war now between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Where is the Shia revival? Um, how is it going to affect the future of the Middle East? And um, how do you see all, all, the, all this, um, the, the, the dominoes coming to rest? Where? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the real game changer here is, are the Shias in the Arab world. I mean, uh, largely because uh, that's where the that's where they were. They, they, you have a large Shia population that has been disenfranchised and has actually been largely invisible, uh, with the exception of Lebanon. For instance, nobody in the West really thought of the fact that 60 percent, 65 percent of uh, of uh, Iraq are Shias, and if you take the Kurds out of Iraq, about 85 percent of Arab Iraq. Are, are Shias, or that uh, 65 to 70 percent of Bahrain are Shias, about 20 percent of Saudi Arabia could be Shias. So you know, this was not on the map, this was not part of the discussion. All of a sudden, the introduction of democracy in the region, whether it came on the back of American guns in Iraq or on the back of popular uprising in the Arab world, has brought out the Shia issue. So the genie's out of the box. The Shias are demanding representation. They don't want to separate, but they want to be so that their numbers are reflected in the distribution of power. The existing systems in the region, largely dominated by Sunnis, are not reconciled to this outcome. You know, and there is resistance. There is resistance in, in, uh, in Iraq, there is resistance in uh, Bahrain, there is resistance in, across the Gulf to this uh, outcome. I mean, Syria is a particular case because actually there the Sunnis are uh, the, the, the majority, but that's also playing out in the same way. So where the chips would fall, if this thing continues, if it really becomes like the 30-year war in the history of Europe, in the end, Iraq will be a Shia country, Lebanon will be a Shia country, Bahrain will be a Shia country, Syria will be a Sunni country, and then in, in, in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, in, in the United Arab Emirates, in all of these countries, you would have significant amount of Shia representation in uh, governance, in society, in politics. The most extreme case is in Saudi Arabia, where about maybe 20, 10 to 20 percent of the population are Shia. There are no Shia ambassadors, there are no Shia members of cabinet, there are no Shia authorities. The Shias are not allowed to have their own schools, they're not allowed to name their own mosques as mosques, they're not allowed to celebrate any particular religious activity associated with Shiism. So, you know, basically they, they, they're not allowed to exist. Uh, that's, those are the kinds of demands that, that need changing. So, so I think uh, politically uh, this is not going to stop until you have uh, the, the numbers game matches the power distribution. Then there's the ideological issue. It's true that Iran's government is a fundamentalist government, but Shias are by definition a force for pluralism because you cannot have a monolithic, narrow, puritanical definition of Islam that excludes about half the population of the region. So the very fact that Shias in Saudi Arabia demand to celebrate Ashura is ultimately Saudi Arabia has to be a very different place. It has to recognize the rights of non wahhabi practices of Islam. And I think that's going to be a very big conflict going forward. I mean, in many places, Shia demands are, are about merely this sort of uh, representation. So I think we're, we're, in a, we're in a for a long haul, and, uh, and, and I think the direction that things are going uh, favors this to continue because um, the, the existing structure protected Sunni domination. 
all the changes that we're seeing in the region are basically favoring the Shias in some because it's putting the issues on the table, whether through elections or through civil wars. And, and I think that uh, uh, means that, you know, uh, this, this will continue. What, you know, what, what we've seen in, in Pakistan is that the Shia Sunni um, sectarian conflict also leads to the, um, to the deaths of, and, and the driving out of other minorities. And that's what we're seeing in the Arab world right now. The traditional uh, Christian, Jewish, um, and, you know, uh, Coptic, other groups that have existed in the Middle East for thousands of years are literally being driven out by, by this, um, by either what you call Sunni triumphalism um, or by this conflict uh, between Sunni and Shia. Well, you know, generally, uh, um, I mean, what, what we're basically seeing is that on the Sunni side of the equation, you have an increasingly puritanical and narrow view of what is Islam. I mean, the more, the more you narrow who is a Muslim and what is Islam, you know, you keep lopping off those who uh, don't belong. And the largest category here, at least in the Arab world, in the Middle East, are, are the Shias. And uh, so the Shias become basically a barometer for the direction in which the Sunni discussion about tolerance and about pluralism goes. If you look at Saudi Arabia, when Ibn Saud took over the peninsula, there were many different expressions of Sunni Islam. There, there used to be four different Sunni calls to prayer every noon in Mecca. There were Sufis, there were all kinds of uh, uh, schools of Islam were represented on the peninsula. Today, there's only one left, which is Shiism. In fact, it's the only force that has withstood uh, Wahhabism and has refused to buckle. And that's actually much of the problem that the Shias feel in the kingdom is largely because of that. So, the, the, the issue is that if the Saudis give in to the Shias, they have to give in to all the other Sunnis who want to also celebrate Milad al Nabi, and all the Sufis who want to practice uh, their own uh, uh, rituals, and all the other Sunni groups who want to have their own calls to prayer and practice their own version of Islamic law in the kingdom. So the pressure that comes from Saudi Arabia from puritanical schools of Islam is to deny this sort of acceptance of different interpretations of Islam. And the Shiites are right now, and the force that is in the region is pushing for this acceptance. I think it's a, it's a very interesting case that when the you know, Iraq uh, uh, civil war between Shiites and Sunni started, a number of Arab governments tried to hold these big conferences uh, to sort of bring everybody together and say, well, you know, sectarianism is the fault of outsiders, and we should, we're all Muslims, and we all should be together. And in one of these conferences, the senior Shia cleric in Iraq, I told the Sistani, had a very simple message. You know, this all begins by accepting Shia law as a legitimate school of Islamic law. The rest of it is polemics. That's the fundamental demand that, 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 you, know, that, that you would accept this. So if that's what the Shias are asking, that's what they're asking is to be recognized as a legitimate school of Islam and to be, uh, to be given their share of power. And that, I think, is uh, not something that you can gloss over, so either can suppress it through authoritarianism, or you can go to war with it, as we're seeing in, in Iraq, uh, or ultimately you have to accommodate it. Um, my third theme is, is the rise of Islamic extremism. Uh, the, sudden, the sudden increase of Islamic extremist groups in the Middle East, does this spell a dramatic shift in the balance of power in the Arab world? I never thought that Al-Qaeda could capture a city, but it has done so in Iraq. Can these groups actually win power and govern a state or establish a caliphate as they say they want to? Possibly. You know, you could look at this, the early years of the Saudi monarchy as a sort of a Taliban-like, Al-Qaeda-like takeover, highly puritanical, militaristic, with a, with a, with a uh, sort of a very uh, efficient cadre of fighters who were fighting under a banner of a very puritanical message, highly intolerant, wanting to impose a, a draconian interpretation of the Sharia on the broader population. They did conquer all of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and then they sort of mellowed down and they began to govern. So uh, uh, there, is a, there is a transition from being insurgents to being uh, a, a government. In Afghanistan, you know, the Taliban were probably gradually going through that process when 9-11 happened, and then they forcibly were dislodged. So, 
I think we are at the phase where the extremists are a serious energetic force in the region. Uh, that they are recruiting people, that the ideology has traction, at least with segments of society. It is tied to the uh, uh, anti-colonial rhetoric that actually was brought to the Middle East during colonial period and actually was popularized by the left. It's a sort of been internalized into the rhetoric of, uh, of, of, uh, of the extremists, this war against imperialism and the outside combined with the desire for a puritanical society. And uh, right now, the, the forces in the region that are supposed to be able to contain this are collapsing. So you have an economic situation in the Arab world or in Pakistan that is not conducive to supporting a, a middle class and a private sector in a robust way. You have too much poverty. You have too many uh, lack of government services. And on the other side, also the uh, security apparatuses that are supposed to contain these kinds of forces are collapsing. So the Arab Spring in Egypt battered the Egyptian military. So we saw that the minute the Egyptian military began to withdraw, the extremists and jihadists took over the Sinai Peninsula and then began to infiltrate Egypt itself. The minute Gaddafi, the security forces, whatever they were, collapsed, what replaced it was essentially armed tribes and armed insurgents. Same, same things happening in Iraq, same things happening in Syria, and, uh, and, and therefore, you know, partly the strategy now is to create security forces in the region that actually can impose uh, law and order. But, but I wouldn't say that jihadists are a dominant force in the region. But there is serious, they have serious capabilities, there is serious force, but the other forces that are supposed to be able to withstand this are not there. And, and the more the region ends up in conflict, and the more it's, uh, you have these sort of clashes between regional rivals and collapsing regimes, the more opportunity it provides for groups like Al-Qaeda. Well, in, in Syria, what we've seen is that uh, the West is now more scared of, uh, of these jihadist groups than it is President Assad. And in fact, some of the Americans have started apparently secret dialogue with, uh, with Assad in order to perhaps show him up. So are we, are we, are we just going to see now uh, the West going back to supporting dictatorships, uh, which will then fight Al-Qaeda? Well, uh I think that what the West will do is not as per se go back to dictatorship. They will go. They will become increasingly reliant on whoever on the ground it is that can 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 contain and deal with these thugs. I mean, it's a, it's a very it's a very strange, it's simple calculus. If you have another bomb in London that's traced back to Syria, I can tell you the British government is going to be much more openly uh, shoring up Assad and talking to Assad. It's a question of priorities. Uh, you know what's happening in Syria is horrendous. But right now, it is not a, a threat to, uh, in other words, the, 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 the civil war, the democracy movement, the fight against Assad is a humanitarian issue, is a, is a, is a crisis, but it's not an actual threat to uh, security and stability on the outside. The Al Qaeda groups are. And, and I think so long as Western countries look at the scene and say, well, you know, Assad may be horrible, but Assad's not a threat to us. But, but the Islamic uh, State of Iraq and Syria will be going after targets in the West. And it might be a repeat of uh, you know, the Bin Laden State in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan is going to show up at some Western capital. That then has a logic of its own. How are you going to deal with that? You either have to invade these countries one by one. Uh, and I think everybody, not only in this part of the world, but in the West, believes that that didn't really work very well. That's not, that, the that's not in the cards. So what is, what is plan B if you're not actually going to go into these countries and clean them out? So you have to look to some local, uh, local uh, power authority. Now, it might not be Assad. The other argument people make is that the West has to invest in creating a, a Syrian military unit that is armed and trained by the West that will you would unleash against these people. But if that's really successful, it's going to pr produce a Napoleon out of it. You're not going to get a, a Democrat out of training uh, military fighters to go fight Al-Qaeda. There, there's more and more evidence that um, Pakistani militants are going to the Middle East and fighting there. Something like three to 400 Pakistanis now fighting with the uh, Al-Qaeda forces in Syria. 
Um, and, and in fact, there's one uh, unit which is made up specifically of Pakistanis from Lashkar Jangmi and also Lashkar Taiba and, and these groups and Al Qaeda itself. So, do you see a growing nexus between Pakistani extremist groups and some of these new eruptions of extremism in the Arab world? And, and I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean that these fighters are now no longer going to be used to fight in Kashmir or in Afghanistan and are going to be um, uh, directing their energies to the Middle East? Well, that remains to be seen. Right now, if you're a jihadi, the place to be is in Syria. That's where the big, that's where the big fight is. That's where the money is. That's where uh, you know even the, the prestige of the fighting is. There is, there is no, you know, there is a culture at least at the core of, of mercenary activity among whether it's Arab or Pakistani hardened fighters, and they move from theater of battle to theater of battle. Many of these people went and fought in Chechnya against Russian troops. Uh, some of them had fought in Bosnia. And then they came back. They, they went to uh, Afghanistan during the uh, American occupation. You know, some have come back. Now, a lot are going to, to Syria. There are many reasons this is happening. One is that there is need for, for, for soldiers, foot soldiers. So there, there, there's a call, basically, for uh, volunteers to go from the right of the parts of the Arab world as well as South Asia to fight in Syria. Secondly, it is that many, many of these groups actually want to send fighters there because that's where they're going to get training. And then they would be basically uh, become hardened fighters that are used at home. Where there is a very clear problem uh, in terms of becoming intermingled, there is a very clear cultural linguistic division between Arabs and South Asians. I mean, they, they coexisted in Afghanistan in Fatah, but they never really blended together. Uh, and there were tremendous amount of resentments uh, at times in Afghanistan uh, or Fatah towards the Arabs. And I think uh, Pakistanis will, can be sort of guest workers also in, uh, in, in the Syrian fight, but they're not going to be given citizenship rights any more than they are in the Gulf countries where they work. You know, as Pakistanis, I mean, we have never contemplated an Arab world on the verge of disintegration. But this is something that we all have to do now and, and, and see what that means for Pakistan. We have looked to the Arab world for cheap oil, for political support, weaponry, loans, diplomatic uh, support against India. What happens to, to this Pakistani dependence on the Arab world? Um, you know, I mean, where do we go from here? Well, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan's greatest dependence has been on the Arab Emirates of the Persian Gulf. It has actually had very little sort of either economic or, uh, or political interaction with the heart of the Arab world. Uh, and for now, the, the trouble hasn't quite spread to uh, the Gulf. So in some ways, uh, Pakistan has been immune for the war, from the worst that's happening in the Arab world. There are two problems. One is that there could be an ideological blowback. I mean, if, uh, if you have a much more hardened Sunni ideology emerging out of the sectarian fights and the civil wars of the Arab world, the question is, you know, how much of it will impact uh, Pakistan? To, to what extent is Pakistan receptive to importing you know, sort of a new brand of Salafism back from the uh, Arab world? Uh, the second is that um, if there is an economic impact. You know, there are large numbers of Pakistani workers who work in the Gulf. They are a source of revenue. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons Pakistan has withstood Western pressure has been because of remittances. Although, ironically, remittances now from uh, Europe and North America now is much more than from the Arab world. Uh, but that's still a significant amount of money. So in the short run, if you have a crisis in the region that leads to guest laborers leaving, there are millions in Saudi Arabia, for instance, it, it would have an economic impact on, on Pakistan. So in the short run, it would be very hard. In the longer run, it actually may, may, may force a readjustment economically and otherwise in Pakistan if, the, um, if that economic safety valve of the, of the Gulf is no longer there. So, you know, the energy question in Pakistan would actually have to be seriously solved if there's no cheap. Uh, Arab world coming in. You know, uh, we already have um, uh, police and security forces in many of the Gulf states, um, in Bahrain, in Oman, uh, 
um, in the UAE. I, is there a danger, you think, that Pakistan could become a kind of mercenary state uh, to defend the status quo in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf? And, and, and how would that affect Pakistan in the region and internally? Well, given, given the strategic dependence that Pakistan has on the Gulf countries, there is a temptation to play this card. And you could say there is a strategic logic to it. If you're getting a lot of oil, if you're getting a lot of remittances, you could say that even it makes perfect sense for Pakistan to try to defend the existing order in the Gulf because it's really defending its own sources of revenue. And it's a very logical, rational thing to do. But it's a very dangerous matter for Pakistan to play this role because it's not Pakistan's fight. It's not Pakistan's so, so fighting somebody else's national interest. Ultimately, it's very dangerous. And in the Gulf, it's not just that Pakistan will be summoned in to suppress a uh, group of people who are, who are rising up the way that rumor has it that Pakistani soldiers were summoned to suppress the uprising in the Grand Mosque in Mecca in 1979, uh, and then to protect the Saudi family against similar kind of Wahhabi uprisings. I think this time in the Gulf, it will really put Pakistan in the crosshairs of Iran. The big battles in the Gulf involve Iran. And, and you know, the, the ground zero of this is Bahrain. And uh, Iraqis, uh, Shiites in the Arab world, uh, Iranians uh, view Bahrain as a sort of a strategic issue. And, uh, and, and if Pakistan is seen as the trump of the Arab world is suppressing Bahrain, if Pakistan comes to be seen as the trump of Saudi Arabia, then Pakistan would be put in the same basket in Iran's eyes or in Iraq's eyes or in others as they put Saudi Arabia. And, and that has implications for Pakistan, particularly because I think Pakistan within itself has the same divisions between Shiites and Sunnis that it's trying, it would be pushed to try to suppress uh, in, in Bahrain. And once blood is led in, in these kinds of fights, then I don't think that necessarily you won't have, you won't import the same sort of debates within your own society as to where the moral or the political uh, right and wrong is here. Well, you know, we, we've already seen in the last few days a, a quite a, a dramatic shift in policy. The, the present government has decided to support the Saudis. Uh, we, we had a, a position of neutrality in the war in Syria uh, up till now, and there is now a position where the government is saying we support the Saudis um, and uh, demand that uh, President Assad should go. Um, what impact is this going to have? How is this going to affect Pakistan's relations with Iran? Well, it definitely won't help uh, in the sense that uh, the, the positions on, on, on Syria have now become quite black and white. So uh, the Saudi position, the American position is that Assad has to go. The Russian position and the Iranian position is that Assad's not the problem, terrorism is the problem, and you can't start uh, basically by demanding Assad to go. So if, if Pakistan is going to be on one particular side, and it's diplomatically neither neutral nor supporting Iran, it's supporting the Saudis. More than likely, there will be some kind of an Iranian reaction at some point. It might be not very significant, or it might be much more important. Again, the, the uh, uh, issue which is on the table is that Iran and Pakistan have a lot of uh, chips in the play in Afghanistan. I think for both of them, at least in this region, that's the main issue that they have to focus on. The United States leaving with the future of Afghanistan up in the air with a history between these two countries on being on the different sides of the civil war. Uh, uh, one of the things that actually has, uh, has uh, enabled Afghanistan to survive uh, in the past four or five years is, is really that Pakistan and Iran have not been very terribly engaged against one another in Afghanistan. And there was at some point the hope that actually might jointly manage uh, this, this issue. But if the relations between uh, uh, Pakistan and uh, Iran become much more tense, it would get reflected in Afghanistan. And the Iranians have always reacted to uh, overt Pakistani overtures to Saudi Arabia by basically reaching out to India. So you're going to see Iran then, even at a diplomatic level, begin to support India on a host of issues uh, as a retaliation for uh, Pakistani support for Saudi position in Syria. So essentially what you're saying is that with the, with the disintegration in the Arab world 
and a process that could go on for many, many years, Iran is going to become the center of gravity in the region, whether we like it or not. Yes, I think we are seeing that trend. Uh, when the Arab Spring happened, the perception in the West was that this would be a strategic defeat for Iran. Uh, Arab Spring was about democracy, Iran is an authoritarian regime. Arab Spring was empowering initially secular forces, Iran was a religious theocracy, and then Iran was going to lose uh, Syria, and, uh, and that was a very big loss for Iran. Now that we sort of are two, three years in, into this, actually if you look at it by some measure, Iran is actually the most stable country in the region, Turkey included. You know, you had an election, there were no people on the streets, it has a president that at least most people think that, you know, it's popular, uh, the system has stabilized, there are more people protesting in the streets of Istanbul than they are in, in, in Tehran. That's not to say that the regime is democratic, but it's, it's stable. Uh, and it's definitely more stable than the Arab. I mean, if you really look at the Arab world, all of its power centers have collapsed. Egypt is a, is, is a shade of what it was. Syria has collapsed, Iraq has collapsed, and Saudi Arabia is trying to sort of shore up the Arab world but does not have the capacity to do so. So the Arab world as a whole is on the decline. The Iranians have survived. And then in Syria, the way Syria has turned out, it's gone from an Iranian defeat to an Iranian victory. Because Iran has showed that it actually has been capable of supporting a regime that it considers to be a friend, despite international pressure. So the more, in fact, we, we, the West accuses Iran of having troops on the ground fighting on the side of Assad, the more it's telling everybody that this country, despite sanctions, is capable of running a war in another country twice removed from itself. That capability doesn't exist anywhere else in the, in the Middle East. So the Iranians actually have this attitude that, you know, Assad has survived the worst of it. They hold all the cards in Syria. They hold the cards in Lebanon. They are in a good position in, in Iraq. And then guess what? Now even the United States has decided that it might end the isolation of Iran and actually engage Iran. And uh, so very clearly, you know, the dynamic in the region is moving in Iran's, uh, in Iran's direction. And, uh, and, I, and I think that basically if in the next six months you have a deal between Iran and the United States, that essentially will confirm Iran's strategic position. That's a reality. In fact, a lot of the anger we see in the Persian Gulf towards American opening to Iran is really a reflection of uh, this realization. Well, we have a lot to lose uh, as far as Iran is concerned. I mean, we want to import energy and gas and electricity from Iran. Uh, we want to stable, help stabilize Afghanistan with the, with the aid of Iran. Um, and, and, you know, we don't want to be left on the sidelines of history in that sense. I mean, we want to be able to maintain relations with the Arabs and Iran on an equal footing. Um, not to speak of the fact that, we, that that is the only way we can stabilize this, the Shia-Sunni conflict inside Pakistan and not allow this proxy war by being fought by Iran and Saudi Arabia coming onto the soil of Pakistan. Well, first of all, there is no stability in Afghanistan uh, unless there is some kind of a, a common ground of collaboration between Iran and Pakistan. And Pakistan has a lot more to lose from instability in Afghanistan than, than Iran has, just because of the geography and the way this has worked, and also because of the kind of relationship Iran has built with Afghanistan is very different from Pakistan's relationship with Afghanistan. So we can forget about stability in Afghanistan. In other words, a clash between Iran and Pakistan can doom Afghanistan into a prolonged proxy fight between these two. Secondly, it, uh, alienation of Iran essentially means that Pakistan will put itself between an alliance between two powerful countries of Iran and India. And that really doesn't benefit the strategic position of, uh, uh, of, of Pakistan. And Pakistan has to open to one of these two. Uh, has to play a game of trying to avoid a tight Iranian-Indian uh, alliance against, uh, against these two. And then thirdly is that, uh, you know, at some level, for now, it looks like Iran is the rising power of the region. And uh, the question is, you know, does, does Pakistan want to hedge that and put some of its bets on, on relations with Iran or not? And then in terms of energy, in terms of access, ultimately, uh, uh, you know, that's very important to Pakistan. Iran's natural gas 
is the simplest solution to Pakistan's energy problem. It's much cheaper than gas that would come from the Gulf, because gas from the Gulf would have to be liquefied and then regasified. It has much more expensive transportation to, to, uh, to Pakistan. It requires LNG terminals. It's much more difficult. Whereas the Iranian gas would come overland in pipelines, it doesn't need, need to be liquefied. It's going to be much cheaper, and then it can be re-exported from Pakistan to further east, into China, into Western China, and into India, and also provide uh, uh, additional revenue in forms of tariff for Pakistan. You know, um, after partition, we were considered a South Asian state. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto took us into the Middle East, made us dependent on Arab money, Arab oil, um, and jobs for uh, millions of, of workers who went to the Middle East. Um, it now seems that we're looking at a future in which uh, we, we no longer uh, uh, can be, uh, can afford to be dependent on, on the Middle East. So in a, in a strategic regional dimension, where do we go? What do we do? Uh, who do we befriend? Given the fact that you know, India on one side is still not willing uh, to fully make up with Pakistan, um, and, and there's this conflict uh, internally in Pakistan, there's a conflict in the Arab world, um, when, you know, when, is, is there a block that will emerge in this region or in which we can play a role? Possibly. I mean, but partly depends on Pakistan taking a proactive role of imagining what that block ought to be. I mean, the reality is uh, that it's, it, was, it was animus with India that pushed uh, Pakistan in the direction of the Middle East. If the Middle East is not hospitable, environment for Pakistan, then it, it, it either has to find a way to be part of South Asia and build relations with India and open trade and uh, arrive at some kind of a coexistence, uh, or that it would have to ultimately find at least a, 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 a sort of st stable environment between Iran and, and, and India that won't, be, won't aggravate the current situation for Pakistan. But economically, as I said yesterday, you, you know, strategically, in terms of security, in terms of territorial issues, Pakistan is where it is. That's its geography. But I think in many ways, economically, Pakistan needs to belong to a much bigger virtual community of emerging markets. That's the way many countries uh, sort of con conceive of what bloc they belong to. Even if you look at today, in, whether you look at WTO, or you look at the United Nations, you look at conferences on climate, on energy, most countries are not aligned Regionally, countries are aligned virtually with like-minded countries in similar situations elsewhere in the world, and and that's a possibility for for Pakistan. It's, it's not a question. It, it's a question of basically imagining strategically where you're where where you want to belong, what sort of a, a profile of a country or what sort of a profile of alliances Pakistan needs internationally. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to open up. Two questions. Uh, if the people with mics, can you put the lights on so I can see, uh, so I can see what's going on? Or dim the lights in my face? Uh, we've got 15 minutes. We're happy, happy to take questions. Okay, there's a girl there. I'm right there. Over here. Hi. She's got the mic. Uh, can, you, can you say who you are? My name is Stand up and say who you are. Okay. <laughs> my name is Benazi Shah and I work for Newsweek Pakistan. And I wanted to ask you was that this uh, resurgence of uh, sectarianism in Pakistan, this Shia Sunni killings, could this lead to the revival of Shia militias in Pakistan? For, for example, the defunct Sipai Muhammad, similar to what's happening in Iraq? It could, but uh, so far it hasn't, uh, and, uh, and in, in the conditions under which that might, might, might be the case remain.